Luke chapter 1. Stand with us, please. Let's read this passage together. We begin in the 26th verse, reading down through verse number 38. Luke 1, beginning with verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible." Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You can be seated. Silence oftentimes, it sets the stage for significant events. Usually if a speaker is going to come and he's going to take a platform or take the stage and as he begins to walk to that place or she begins to walk to that place, there will be a, there will be a hush in anticipation of, of what the speaker is going to say. Well, there's been that such of a time as far as Scripture goes. If we were to, if we were to transport back to this place, if you, were, if you were here, I think it was last fall, about a year ago, maybe the first part of this year we finished it up, but we we covered the, the minor prophets as, as we come to the close of the Old Testament and, and we got a word that God would speak to those prophets and they would, in turn, they would speak to the people of God and give, give them the message. Well, when the, when the Old Testament ends, God grows silent. He doesn't speak. There's not a word to a prophet. There's not a, there's not a word from anybody necessarily to anybody. And this hadn't happened for a day or for a week, but, it's, but it goes on for 400 years. So for 400 years, is, there's been silence as far as from God. But now when we come to this place in Scripture, we have to, we have to assume that in heaven, a great stir begins to happen on this particular morning. Because the Creator God, He calls the angels, He calls the ranks of the angels to attention, and He says, hey, I'm going to send one of you. We know that He's going to send Gabriel. He said, I'm going to send you, and, and I want you to leave heaven immediately to deliver the first message that I've delivered in these 400 years. Well, we, we know it, that if we went back and we talked about this on Wednesday night in the story of Zacharias, we, we know that, that Gabriel's first stop was, was to that gentleman. It was to, it was to the priest named Zacharias, and, and Gabriel told him, and, and we read about it in, in just a, a snippet of it in this passage, and you can read about it. It begins in the fifth verse and goes down to the 25th verse of, of Luke chapter 1, but but in essence, Gabriel told Zacharias, he said, Zacharias, he said, I know that you're old and I know that your wife is old. He says, but, but, but you're going to have a son. And you're not just going to have any son. Your son is going to be, his name's going to be John. It's going to be John the Baptist. And, and John is going to be the forerunner to the Messiah. Well, what this meant to Zacharias, well, one, he was, that he was going to have a son, but, 
But, but we also have to remember that it also meant that the Messiah, if somebody's going to be the forerunner to the Messiah, the message also says that the Messiah is coming. So, so that's the word to Zacharias. And, and it's so hard for Zacharias to believe that, that he and Elizabeth are going to have a baby because, because they're sure enough old. And, and, and finally, Gabriel just tells Zacharias, he said, Zacharias, he said, you're not even going to be able to speak until John is born. Well, Gabriel delivers this message. And Gabriel goes back, I, I assume he goes back to heaven. And six months later, the scripture tells us, we pick it up in the 26th verse of our text today, the Most High God summons Gabriel again. And he says, Gabriel, I need you to leave heaven right now. He said, I've got another errand for you to run. I've got something that I need you to do. I need you to go to a, to a little town called Nazareth. And he said, because in this little town called Nazareth, there's a, there's a particular young girl that I've selected to be the mother of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, we know that, we, we know that the Scripture tells us that her name was Mary. And we know that the Scripture also tells us in that 26th verse that she was betrothed to a young Jewish boy or man by the name of Joseph. In the 27th verse, the, the Scripture begins to tell us about this engagement period. And, and it, wasn't just, it wasn't like today where we just go with somebody or you go with somebody and have a boyfriend or girlfriend. But, but this time of betrothal, was, it, it was legally binding. And, and, and you couldn't get out of this, this time of, of, of betrothal and it could only be broken by divorce or death. Well, well, Luke, Dr. Luke, he highlights something in that verse of Scripture, in that 27th verse. He highlights the fact that, that Mary is a virgin. That's what the Scripture means when it says that she has known no man. I, I know not a man. He highlights the fact that, that, that she is a virgin. And, and, and it lets us know that the birth of the Messiah, the birth of Christ, is going to be a supernatural event. Well, in the, 20, in the 28th verse... Gabriel gives a greeting. He gives a greeting to Mary, and it was simple, but it was profound. And, and depending on your translation of the Bible, it, it says, maybe it, it could say, hell, favored one, or, or, or my translation says, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Mary, you see, Mary was the recipient of of the grace of God in this, and this, this thing that God was about to do. Well, in the 29th verse, we, 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 we look at Scripture and we could pose the question, well, what did the angel mean? Well, what, what did he mean here? Why would God send an angel with a special message just for her? And can't you imagine the fact that, that the angel talked about the fact that, that, that she was troubled? The Scripture tells us that she was troubled. You would be troubled too. If an angel just appeared from nowhere and began to speak to you and to tell you these things that were, that were fixing to happen. And in the 30th verse, Gabriel sensed Mary's fear. And, 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 and he quickly spoke to her, reassuring her that she had found favor with God. And, 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 and that sort of said, stay. the message that Gabriel was about to deliver to Mary was not only going to change Mary's life, but the message that Gabriel delivers to Mary still changes lives today. It changed your life if you've been saved. It's this message that, that changed. So, so in essence, we could say if we just needed a kind of a, a throw line to go along with this message, we could just simply say this, Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. We, we hear the phrase sometimes when we, we find out something and we get a little bit of information and we'll, we'll use the phrase something along the line, well, well, that's a game changer. That changes things. Well, I tell you, when, when, when Gabriel comes and he delivers this message to Mary that she is going to be the mother of the Messiah, that I'm telling you, this message changed her life and this message changes the world. So when God speaks, for the first time in 400 years, this message that he gives Gabriel, he, he gives some staggering 
news about three things that I want to share with you this morning. First of all, news about the goal of her son. News about the goal of her son. Here's that 31st verse. It says, And behold you, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Now get this, because this doesn't fit our byline. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he was incarnated as a man. That's a, that's a big word. And it wasn't just so that God would have something to do on this particular day, but, but, but Jesus Christ was incarnated as a man for a strategic purpose. And did you know that you were a part of that strategic purpose? Did you know that? I'm telling you, we were. Well, well, let's look at just a couple of things about this. Because we, 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 first of all, we will see the explanation of his goal. The explanation of it. Now, here's what Gabriel said to Mary. He says, early on in the verse, after he says, behold, he says, you. Well, then he tells her, he says, you'll conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And, and then at the end of that verse, the last little phrase of that verse says this, shall call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus was a common name. There were, there were a, probably a, a, a lot of little boys that, that had that name, but there were none that could live up to that name. Because you see that the, the name Jesus means this, the Lord is salvation. So there's, there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of little old boys running around, and they have the name Jesus, but, but they, they can't live up to the name. Now, now, Matthew's gospel tells us also that an angel appeared to Joseph. Now, the angel that appeared to Joseph told Joseph this in Matthew 1, 21. He says, and she, that, that would be Mary, Mary will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Now, now, can you imagine this young couple married somewhere in the, in the neighborhood, and we could argue this back and forth, but somewhere in the neighborhood of probably about 15 years old. And, and can you imagine this young virgin girl trying to grasp the significance of God's message that he sent to her through Gabriel? Listen, to, today we still struggle with the ramifications of the good news of the gospel. We still struggle with, with this powerful message, and the powerful message is this. Jesus Christ came into this world to save the human race from their sins. That's why Jesus came into this world, to save you and you and you and you and you and me. And, and listen, I'm telling you, that is a powerful message, and we still struggle to understand it. Well, this angel appears pretty well out of nowhere, and he speaks to this young Mary, who is going to be the, mo the earthly mother of the Messiah, and he speaks to her, and, and he, the angel also speaks to Joseph over in Matthew's account, and he tells him, he says, hey, Jesus, if that's who you're going to have, and he tells Joseph, he says, he's going to save his people from their sins. Now, you say, well, maybe that's that's a good message for him when, he, when he's just be, being going to be carried for this period of time inside Mary. Well, well, Jesus speaks in Luke, the 19th chapter. And in Luke, the 19th chapter and the 10th verse, that message that he will save his people from their sins does not go away. Because it's there at the end of the story of Zacchaeus that Jesus is speaking. And here's what Jesus said. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save those who are lost, or to save the lost. So I'm, I'm telling you this morning that the angel comes and he speaks to Mary and he gives an explanation of the goal of the Messiah, the Christ child, Jesus. Well, he doesn't stop there. You see, not only do we get an explanation of his goal, we also get the extent of his goal. Now, Jesus was not only, you got to stay with me, Jesus was not only sent to save the Jews, right? Right. We found this out as we looked in Romans for the last several, several weeks. 
Jesus was also sent to save the Gentiles. And I don't know if you know this or not, but that ought to excite you. Because we're the Gentiles. We're, we're, we're of that group. And, and here's, what John, here's the way John said it. In, 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 the most, in one of the most wonderful verses of Scripture in the Bible. We read these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I tell you this morning, that's good news. That's good news for you and for me. That's good news from, if, if, we could, if we could go over to Africa and, and stretch over to Canada, if we could go from America and stretch over geographically to China, if we could go from Europe over to the Middle East, if we could go from the North Pole to the South Pole, I'm telling you this morning, just as it was then, so it is now that Jesus is the only hope that anybody has of salvation. I tell you again, Jesus changes everything. Jesus has changed our view of salvation. Now, Mary, she's just a young teenage girl. And, and, and she must have been surprised when she discovered the goal of her son. That his, the, his reason in coming was to save his people from their sins. Well, that, that level of surprise was carried a step farther. It was carried a, a level further when she not only discovered the goal of her son, but she discovered the greatness of her son. It, it says this in the first part of the 32nd verse. This is part of that message. He, that's, that's the Messiah, that's Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of God of the highest. No person could ever compare with God's Son, whom Mary, who was the recipient of this message. Nobody who has ever been born, not, not one of the 100 plus billion people who have ever lived, not, not nobody can compare with God's Son whom Mary was going to bring into this world nine months later. Now, I know we run around and we talk about our kids, and, and, and listen, I'll, I'll just speak for me. I, I wasn't the sharpest pencil in the box. We had 408, I think it was, in our graduating class, and I was number 204. I was either the I was either the last of the smart half or the valedictorian of the dumb half. I never knew which it was. But I'm telling you, man, if you were to talk to my mama, my mama would tell you Stevie's special. He's special. Well, think about, think about the Christ child that this young teenage girl is going to bring into this world. He's going to have, he's going to have perfect wisdom. He's going to have unlimited power. He's going to have supernatural ability. He's going to have grace and love overflowing. Jesus Christ would be the most influential person of all the hundred plus billion that are ever going to be born into this world. He will be the most inf influential person to ever walk on this earth. Well, what is it that's going to make him so great? That, that, that's what Gabriel told her. He said, he'll be great. Well, what's going what's to make him so great? Well, well let, let, let me give you two things. One is his relationship with God. He had Jesus' relationship with God. Now, he was, he was going to be called. We find it in that first part of the 32nd verse. He will be called the what? The son of the highest or the son of the most high. Now, think about this. We all had a beginning you, you, you know you had a beginning? I, I began February the 14th, 1963, at 4.04 in the afternoon. That was my beginning. I don't know when my ending comes, but I've got one. Somewhere down the road, I've got an ending. Well, think about, think about this. Jesus didn't have a beginning. 
And Jesus doesn't have an end. No beginning, no end. Listen, the Bible teaches us that he is eternal in nature. Listen to what John said of Jesus in John verse, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I'm telling you that that, that Jesus is great because of his relationship with God. But not only that, if you were here last Sunday, you know that we spent quite a bit of time, and we won't do it today, but we spent quite a bit of time talking about the fact that Jesus was the revealer of God. He is the revelation of God. And that's the second thing that I want to point out to you that that will make that makes him so great is his revelation of God. Think about this. You and I are finite human. There's a limit to what we can know, there's a limit to what we can do, there's a limit to everything. And and I don't know if you're like me or not, but the older I get, the 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 less that limit is. Can't do as much as you used to do. Can't, there's just a lot. The old, well, my theme song as I get older is becoming the old gray mare. He ain't what he used to be. <laughs> well, we come to know what that means. But so, so we begin to ask this question. How can finite humans like you and I, how can we ever know God? How can we ever know God? Well, well, here's what Isaiah said about this, about our creator. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. For my thoughts, this, uh, that's our Lord, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. And the Lord continues to speak in the ninth verse. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Listen, the only way that you and I could ever truly know God is for him to become one of us. And you know what? That's exactly what he did. Did you know that? The only hope that you and I have of knowing God is for God to become one of us. And and lo and behold, that's exactly what God did. And God did that in the person of Jesus. And, And here's how John describes the incarnation. Still in John, the first chapter we read from a while ago. But it's in the 14th verse and it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. And and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He has declared him. It's no wonder. It's no wonder that the prophet Isaiah and Jesus himself, Spoke of, spoke of his greatness. Listen to what Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. In Matthew 12, 6, we read this. Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. In Luke eleven thirty one, 31, 
it says, The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. I tell you again, Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. Jesus has changed. Now get this. Jesus has changed our ability to know God in a personal way. Mary, and she must have been surprised when she found out the goal of her son was going to be that he was going to come into this world and, and, and die for his people, save his people. She must have been surprised a little more when she found out how great her son was going to be and found out the greatness of her son. Well, her, her, her level of being surprised was carried up another notch because she not only found out the goal and the greatness of her son, but now she finds out the glory of her son. It's in the latter part of the 32nd and the 33rd verse where we read these words, and the Lord God will give him, that's the Messiah, Jesus, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now, notice, notice three things about, about his kingdom. First of all, the distinction of his kingdom. The, the, it, it's that latter part. It's the, 30, it's the part B of that 32nd verse where the, Lord, where the Bible says, The Lord will give to him the throne of his father David. Now, now, now don't skip over that. Don't, don't fly through it without pondering its significance. I'm telling you, that is a significant part of Scripture. Hundreds and hundreds of years prior to this in Scripture, hundreds of years prior to this, the prophet Samuel, he spoke about these words. He spoke about what's written for us by, by Dr. Luke. And, and here's how he does it. It's in 2 Samuel, the 7th chapter. 2 Samuel, the 7th chapter. Let me give you the context of it and while, while you're turning there. The context of 2 Samuel, the 7th chapter is this. Samuel has been instructed. He has been given instruction to go tell David. He's going to go and tell David these things that the Lord has said. So, so if you go back over to 2 Samuel in the 7th chapter, beginning in the 5th verse, you begin to read these things that God told Samuel. He said, Samuel, you go tell David all of these things. And, and he begins in that chapter in the 5th verse. He says, tell him all of these things. So Samuel goes. Now we're going to pick up reading in the 16th verse. And Samuel is almost through speaking to David. But here's what he says in the 16th verse. Now remember, I told you that, that God had, had given these words to Samuel hundreds of years ago, and, and, and they spoke about this same thing that, that, that Luke is telling us in Luke, in, in our passage today in the 32nd verse. Well, here's what happened in 2 Samuel. 16th verse, it says, and your house and your kingdom, now this is Samuel to David, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Then verse 17 says, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. I, I said Samuel. Nathan spoke to David. Now here's the 18th verse. Now when you get to the 18th verse in 2 Samuel, David begins to pray. And he's praying in, 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 in retort to the things that he has heard from Nathan. Now, here's what David does in the 18th verse. King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? What is, what is my house that you have brought me this far? And, and yet, this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. 
Forever's a pretty great while to come, isn't it? Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Well, Isaiah speaks about this. In, in a familiar passage, in Isaiah 9, beginning with the sixth verse, and we, we hear it in Christmas programs every Christmas, and, and it's this passage, For unto you a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We not only see the distinction of the kingdom, we also see the duration of the kingdom. It it says in our text, it says, He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Now, why is that significant when when it falls in Scripture? It's significant because this, the kingdom of Rome, Babylon, Greece, what's happened to all of them? They've fallen. They've fallen or they all will fall. They're kings and all the kings that served in all those places, they're just now names that are associated with history. But listen to me this morning. That's not so with Jesus. Jesus is not a name that's just associated with history. Listen to what John said in in, in Revelation, the 19th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. We know that John gets this vision, and here's what he says in this passage. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and, and he who sat upon him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule the them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not a name. That's just a name of history. He's also a name of present and future. So we see the distinction of his kingdom. We see the duration of his kingdom. It's forever. We also see the domination of his kingdom. Now, now get this in mind. Every person, remember last week we used the the, the number, I think it was from John Blanchard. We used the number of uh, the approximate number of people that have ever lived on this earth at somewhere in the neighborhood, give give a billion or take a billion, of 100 billion people. A hundred billion people. Now get this in mind. Every person, and this includes you and me, every one of those 100 billion plus who have ever lived will one day submit to this child that Gabriel told Mary that she was going to carry and bring into this world. Every one of the 100 billion were one day going to submit to Jesus Christ. Here's how Paul put it in Philippians 2, verse 9, 10, and 11. It says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, that's Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name. Listen to verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, 
Every knee shall bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you know what this means? This simply means that Jesus Christ, this child that Gabriel appears to Mary and says, you're going to, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. You're going to give birth to Jesus. He says, he says this, th- 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 this child shall reign forever and ever, forever and ever. I tell you again, Jesus changes everything. He's a game changer. He's the game changer. Jesus changes the way that we live today. He ought to. Jesus ought to change the way that we live. He he, he ought to change the way that we live. And listen, he is certainly, according to Scripture, which we believe to be inspired, infallible, and inerrant. Jesus also not only changes the way we live now, but he changes the way we're going to live in the future, bless God. I want you to see this in closing. Mary's response. I'm telling you, man, we, we use the phrase sometimes with, Somebody comes in and tells us something, and we say, well, he loaded my boat. He gave me a bunch of information. Well, I'm telling you, little old 15 or so year old Mary, she got a boatload, didn't she? Well, old Mary responds to Gabriel's message. She responds to the message and, and gives great insight as to how we ought to respond. How we today ought to respond to the Christmas message. Can you imagine when Mary's getting all this information? Man, her her mind has got to be spinning almost, swirling, as she she tries to grasp the significance of of the word that after 400 years of being silent that, that, that God sends to her. Can you imagine what her heart rate was? How many of you are medical and, 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 and sort of had a medical background? Could you imagine if she would have had on a, a heart monitor? Man, I bet her old heart was just pity patting along. Her heart's got advantage, it's racing and racing, and, and, and her little old palms. Can you imagine how sweaty they have become? Because she has just received information about the goal, the greatness, and the glory of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. But this event wasn't just an event that happened to a young lady 2,000 years ago. This is an event that's still changing people's lives and hearts today. And I'm telling you that if you're here today, this, this Christ child has sure enough changed Mary's life. He can change yours. He can change your heart and he can change your life. I I, I tell you this morning, every one of us in this room, every believer, every one of us who are Christians in this room, we're a part of God's eternal kingdom. Did you know that? You know when scripture says that his kingdom will know no end, we're a part of that. I'm going to be there. How many of us in this room today, we've heard these words, but yet when we begin to look at our own personal life, we find that that, that we're just sort of barging ahead through life. And and we're we're really not taking much into consideration about the plan of God. You're a part of his plan. He must be a part of your plan. He must be a part of the plans that you make in life. How how many of us as believers in this room today have fallen into a trap of of, of just neglecting Jesus? 
We just, we just kind of do what makes us feel good. I'm telling you, the Scripture teaches us that we ought to live for Him now in anticipation of the day when we serve Him and we'll be in His presence one day. Well, let, let, me, let me read you. I, I, I got sidetracked. Let me read you Mary's response to this message. It begins in the 34th verse. It says, Then Mary said to Gabriel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel said to her, said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived a son in her old age. And, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Now here's Mary's reply. Mary said, behold the maid servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then the, that, mess, that, that passage, Scripture ends, and the angel departed from her. Let me show you what happened. Surprise. I, I posted on Facebook, one of my, my favorite shows, Andy, Andy Griffith. And old Gomer Powell, every once in a while, he goes in that bill, surprise, surprise, surprise. Well, I, I have a feeling if old Gomer had been away from the filling station in Mayberry that day and he had been over there in Nazareth where Mary was, that he would have sat there and he would have been in his chair over in the corner, he would have said, surprise, surprise, surprise. You know what Mary's surprise turned into? Submission and obedience. She said, she said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word as you have spoken. I pray this Christmas season, these two weeks, we're two weeks out from what, what we call Christmas Day. I pray that our response to the message of Christmas will be the same response that Mary responded with 2,000 years ago. And that we would just respond in submission and obedience. If you're here and, you're, and you know you've been saved but you're not living for the Lord, your, your proper response would be, to ask him to help you to live your life in submission to the plan and the word of God for your life. If you're here today and you've never been saved, your proper response is to, is to ask the Christ child, the Messiah, the Holy One, to save you. That's why he came. He came so that you could be saved and your response would be to submit yourself to him and his saving grace for your life. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll all get different kind of presents. But I will assure you, you will not get one that's greater than the gift that is offered to each of us from the word of God this day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this majestic story of Christmas. Lord, this morning we've, we've heard a story that the majority of us have heard many, many, many times through the course of our life. But Lord, today I pray that as we've heard these words again, we've heard the story again. Lord, that, that, that we realize that we need to respond to this story. And if we've been saved, our response is just to live a life of obedience to you. Live a life of submission to you. And to follow you and, and to find your plan and your will for our life and, and to live our life according to that. Lord, if we're here today and we've never been saved, our response is to ask you, the, the blessed Son of God, to come into our heart, forgive us of our sins, and to save us from unrighteousness. Lord, this morning, just do what only you can do 
in the way that only you can do it. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.